Good evening, and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible class. This is the last Wednesday that you have to put up with me for now, because I think I saw that Baxter uh, arrived safely and was sleeping in his driveway this morning on Facebook. There, there's a couple things I've learned about this experience, and one is I have an appreciation for what Baxter does always with teaching and preaching as often as he does in kind of putting together lessons. But another thing is in this virtual world, it's been very interesting. I currently have three screens up right now for the PowerPoint, my notes, making sure the sound's good and everything like that. It's just a lot more cognitive load to deal with, uh, kind of while you're teaching a class than usual, and also the fact that there's zero interaction back and forth, so it's a very challenging thing. So I have an appreciation for, a newfound appreciation for Baxter and also for all the teachers who are dealing with this virtually right now. It's just a very different experience. So um, it definitely been a learning opportunity for me as we go, but I think we've done a pretty good study of Hebrews. So with that being said, let's jump into Hebrews chapter 6 tonight and learn about our spiritual progress. Um, so we'll kind of be picking up where we left off last week in chapter 5 with the idea that we uh, it's important for us to continue to grow spiritually. You know, we can't always um, just drink the milk of the Bible, we need to move on to the meteor topic. So we'll start by reading actually Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 through 6 together. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So as you might remember from last week towards the end, it's important for the readers of Hebrews and us today to continue to grow spiritually. We can't just stop with where we were when we became Christians. It's interesting to me because I think our tendency in the church is to think that the bar is higher than it has to be to actually become a Christian. And what I mean by that is oftentimes we feel like we need to know more of the Bible than we actually need to to become Christians. It's important that we understand why we're doing what we're doing, but ultimately we need to understand you know, who Jesus is and why he died for us and what that means for us. And we don't have to be a scholar in the book of Leviticus to become a Christian. However, I think because we have that higher bar in our minds to become a Christian, we then carry that on as the, the only bar we ever need to achieve. That, that bar never moves up as far as our understanding. And so I think that's important, going to be an important takeaway for us. Um, so, you know, just some quick takeaways here are that it's important to make sure that we have a base understanding of what it takes to become a Christian. That's very important. Um, and then from there, we need to continue to learn and put into practice those more mature topics. And this is how we become complete as Christians. Um, I thought I would try to put this in some more practical terms of how we do that. And interestingly enough, it's a part of my morning routine. I go to a website called lifehacker.com and I read through articles on how to life hack in various areas. And for those of you who may not know what a life hack is, it is a strategy or technique adopted in order to manage one's time and daily activities in a more efficient way. So it's a new way of saying just how do I be more productive, essentially. And there was a good article a couple of days ago about 10 methods to acquire effective knowledge. And I think that'll help us set the stage for how to gain spiritual knowledge. I've tried to kind of take each of these and put them together with some, uh, or most of them, and put them together with some Bible verses um, because, you know, a lot of things in the secular world actually have deep roots in the Bible. So let's take a look at those with the goal of um, looking at some ways that we can practically increase our knowledge. Um, and I'm going to do something that presenters aren't supposed to do and show everything on the screen at once instead of kind of as we go through them. So uh, just make sure to read those and pay attention to me talking. Um, but to begin with, um, you know, the, the thing this article called out was researching meticulously. And the idea was here that before you can even start to gain knowledge, you need to understand what you're trying to gain knowledge about, right? And so for this, for us in the spiritual world, 
if we go and we read the Quran or some other document, that's not going to help us get closer to God. So we need to make sure we understand what is the right material for us to spend our time studying. And that's, of course, the Bible. But for And I feel like for a lot of us, we know why that is, where the Bible comes from, why we believe what's written there. But if you don't have a good understanding or you're not there yet, that's the first place to start. You really need to understand why it's the source of truth for us um, before you can even work on kind of gaining that deeper knowledge because how do you know that it's the right book to keep studying? So that's the first thing. Then ultimately, the second thing this article pointed out was read books. And for us, that's first and foremost, spending time in the Bible. Um, you know, once you validated that whatever you're going to spend time learning, you know, the right books to go about reading and understanding on it, um, it is time. It is important to spend that time actually reading those books and studying it. I think for the Bible specifically, uh, Baxter had a good series of sermons probably a year or two ago on how to study the Bible and kind of broke that down. Uh, we don't have time to go into all of that today, but I'd encourage you to check those out um, as you have some time because I think that's very important. Um, you know, you can't get everything you need just out of the Bible classes that we have mm -hmm. at church or virtually. Um, but I think it's really important for us to spend time in God's Word to gain a deeper understanding and have more spiritual maturity. We can also use other books. Um, it's very important that we fact check, as John referred to in his sermon on Sunday. Uh, you know, we need to do some fact checking. We need to make sure those line up with the Bible, but there are commentaries and different things. Um, you know, Baxter even hits on some specific examples that we can check out that can help us understand some of those meteor topics. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we need to put the time in to understand those. Then I think extending from there, um, this article went on to talk about operating consciously. Mm -hmm. And so that was, there's kind of a balance, right? We can form good habits, but we also don't need to be completely on autopilot. So when we're reading the Bible to gain more knowledge, it can be helpful to have a routine and a daily Bible reading. So I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, saying that that's not a good thing to do. However, if that's all we do and it's just a routine and it's just checking a box, and we're not reflecting on what we're learning, then it's not ultimately going to change us. So that was the thought of operating consciously is as we're reading things, we need to make sure we take time every day to think about how we're going to apply that to our lives, how it's going to change our lives. So when we think specifically about the Bible, um, we should think about, you know, how are we going to treat people differently? What sin or what thing, what sacrifice might we make, you know, to make ourselves better Christians? So that's really important for us to operate consciously and be thinking about why we're doing what we're doing and take that to heart. And again, like I said, I've included some verses here that I think embody those things and I would encourage you as a part of your studies this week to go and look them up um, as you have time. But I think, you know, I see this exhibited even like if for work or just my personal reading, I am interested in reading some of the books on how to be better at whatever thing, right? But what I notice I'll do is I'll read them and I'll say, yeah, that makes sense. Or even, yeah, that's pretty much common sense. But I don't take notes. I don't make a plan for putting those changes into action. And if I don't do any of that, then nothing ever changes for me. Nothing gets better. You know, if I read a book on how to eat better and I don't actually go buy the groceries and do the things differently based on that, it doesn't really change anything for me. Uh, and we definitely don't want to do that with God's word. So for us to gain that spiritual maturity, we have to learn the things and then put them into practice. On the flip side of that coin, it is important for us to develop good habits. Um, you know, Philippians 4, 8 tells us, you know, that we need to focus on the, the right things and we need to spend our time on that. So while we don't need to just follow God on autopilot, um, it is good to fill our time with good habits, like reading the Bible each day, with making sure that we're praying frequently, making sure that we're being kind to people. You know, if I'm caught up in a sin... I need to look for ways to replace that bad time with good things. If I'm looking at things I shouldn't on the internet, I can replace that by putting away the computer and opening my Bible. If I'm saying things I shouldn't, I can instead devote time each day to prayer. If I'm treating others unkindly, I can challenge myself to be nice to someone each day. Ultimately, the concept here is if you're busy doing good, you won't have near as much time to do the bad. So it's important to develop those good habits based on what we learned from the Bible. Then the article went on to talk about harnessing productivity. And this was around, you know, taking the things we learn and actually doing things with those in a productive way. 
And I think what at least this means to me, as far as in the context of this passage, is it's important for us to find things we're passionate about doing spiritually to kind of keep us going. You know, for those of us who've been Christians for a while, you know how just the daily wear and tear and things that come up can make it really hard to keep going. And if you look at success as a Christian as just being able to get up and preach in front of a congregation or lead at a ladies' day or something like that, um, and you don't particularly enjoy doing that, that's not what all a Christian or being a Christian is about. So it's important for us to find those things that motivate us so that we keep doing that more. There's a lot of opportunities here at the Four Lakes Congregation and just throughout the world um, for us to put our religion into practice. And so we need to, you know, we can't always do all the things that we like to do, but it is important that we find things that we like to do because we're going to be more productive if we're engaged and plugged into it. Um, and like I said, you know, there's going to be things that we need to do. Baxter may love removing snow, and I may not like that as much. And uh, we may be challenged in certain ways to grow and do things we're not necessarily passionate about initially. But I think we can even find ways to become more passionate about those things, ultimately, so that we're productive for God. So those were the first five things. And then I think some other things for us to keep in mind as we're growing in spiritual maturity is we need to set obtainable goals, right? It's important for us as Christians to set goals. Um, and I think this is something that I don't find myself doing enough. You know, if we're going to make sure we're growing spiritually, we need to do exactly what we've learned at the end of last week in, in this passage, right? Like, how do I, if I don't take stock of the fact, am I still only drinking milk or have I moved on to meat? How, would I, how will I know if I'm growing spiritually? So we need to set goals um, from that regard. And, you know, these goals can be things like talking to more people about God or reading the Bible more frequently. Um, and I think those are good goals, but there's also value in setting out, you know, even understanding specific topics that may be deeper. You know, if you want to understand more about the Godhead or the specific pieces of the Old Testament, um, sometimes I think to myself it would be helpful to have a rubric like we do in school and different grades to know where we are spiritually and clearly everyone's journey is a little bit different so it would be very hard to do that um, but I think sometimes even doing that for ourselves might be helpful to say look back each year and say are we growing um, but I think the main point I wanted to make here is while it's important to have goals and be thinking about how we're growing it's important to set things we can actually achieve, right? If I hear a rousing sermon and I say, I'm on fire for God now, and I say, I'm going to memorize the Bible by tomorrow, clearly that's not an achievable goal unless I have all the verses memorized except for Jesus wept, you know. So I need to set obtainable goals um, so I can grow in my maturity. And then, you know, we kind of move on to talking about some things that are impacted by other people with these other ones. You know, it's good to encourage others. I think once, you know, we become a Christian and we start to grow spiritually, we move on past that milk into the more mature topics, it's important that we're impactful on others. We encourage others and we teach others. One of the best ways to see if you've really learned something is by teaching someone else, right? <laughs> They're going to ask you questions. You know, teaching Bible classes is a great way for me to know how much I've learned about a topic because I'm inevitably going to get that question that I don't know the answer to, and I can go and learn from that as well, but also how comfortable do I feel talking through something. So I think that's very important for us to do in encouraging and teaching others. Um, and so we need to take what we've learned from our own Bible study, from Bible classes, and maybe teach other people we know or friends that we have or teach our spouses or our families. Um, or even if they're already members of the church, just discussing what we've learned after a sermon or in our daily Bible study. I think that's very important because it keeps us accountable and it also encourages that other person to be able to talk to you about what they've studied and learned. I think that's a very important concept for us to understand. Um, this article also went to talk about believing in yourself to be able to you know, take the knowledge that you learn and do things with it. And I think for us as Christians, you know, it's important for us to believe in ourselves through God, right? Um, we know that Satan's going to throw challenges at us, and we have to be confident and believe in ourselves to overcome these challenges. And I think it's important for us to remember, you know, Philippians 4.13, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so if we've got God on our side, we can overcome those things, and we can take the things we've learned and spread them about and use them in our lives. So I think that's very important for us to be confident in what we've learned. The last two were kind of 
around learning from our mistakes. So first of all, embracing pain. Um, you know, once we have started to gain knowledge, we're going to find people who challenge us or we may mess up, different things like that. So we have to be willing to learn from our mistakes and get better. Uh, it can be easy for us spiritually when we fail to turn away from God due to shame or guilt, um, you know, or a variety of reasons like we'll talk about a little bit later tonight. Um, but instead, we should use our past to motivate us for the future and learn kind of what trials beset us, what's going to keep us off the straight and narrow. You know, there are certain things that tempt me that may not tempt you, but once we're aware of those things that tempt us, we can learn from it so that we don't do it again. And we can also help others with our experiences. So that's important for us to do. And then ultimately, we should learn from our mistakes, right? Um, we need to take those mistakes um, from that pain that we've gone through and, you know, have a change based on that, right? Ultimately, repentance generally comes about because we feel that we have hurt God or we have hurt ourselves or hurt our families and we want to turn back towards God. And so it's important for us to be humble enough to learn from our mistakes, admit that we've done wrong and come back to God. So I think these are 10 things that kind of appeal to me based on that article that I read that I thought would help set the context for us gaining that deeper spiritual knowledge. I'd be interested if you all have other thoughts, you know, you can either paste them in the chat or you can send them to me or we can talk about it at church. But just to understand how you've gone through and made sure that you're gaining that deeper spiritual knowledge. So with that in mind, um, I hope that was a little helpful in framing how we should grow spiritually. I think another thing to mention is just we have to be consistent in what we do. Um, there's a rule, you know, that I've heard about at work and through other things in college called the 10,000 hour rule. And that says if you spend 10,000 hours practicing something, you will be a master at it. So if you uh, play the saxophone for 10,000 hours, you know, and you're practicing in the right way, then you'll, you'll, you're going to be really good at it, which makes sense, right? If you spend time doing something, you're going to get better at it. So whether or not the exact number is 10,000 hours and that applies to all situations, I think we can use that as a baseline to understand what it would take to master Christianity, right? So I'm not saying you hit the 10,000 hour mark and that's your bar and you're done, but let's just use that number. If we just show up for church, assuming that's two hours a week right now, um, that means it would take 96 years to hit that 10,000 hour mark. And so assuming, you know, we're probably at the earliest in our teens, maybe a little bit later on in life, <laughs> If we only spend two hours a week in God's Word, we're never going to master Christianity. Um, so I think that just illustrates to us that we're going to need to spend time um, outside of church in God's Word to be able to become complete and to understand those deeper topics. And I think another thing is we have to have an attitude that wants to strive to grow, that wants to know all of these things and become more mature. And that attitude also encompasses recognizing that we don't always know all the answers, but that we're able to find them through the Bible or through some of those other methods and study the scriptures until we understand and can share those with other people. Um, so it's important to put all that together. Um, and then I wanted to take a quick look at 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 through 5, which kind of gets at this same point. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, babies, long for pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, and coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We see in 1 Peter that we are and should start by laying a good foundation, right? And it's just part of the process to spend more time in God's Word and become more mature. Um, we're being built up for something great, but a building can't just be its foundation. So once that's done, we need to keep laying on more bricks. You know, we none of us would want to just go live in the middle of the winter in Wisconsin in just a foundation, right? We want the whole house or we want the whole apartment building. And that's the same thing, you know, that we're talking about here. We, ha we have to go farther. So finally, getting back to tying it all together, if we don't have faith in God, and this all is just an exercise in gaining knowledge and being more intelligent, um, it's worthless, right? We have to have faith in God. And Hebrews 11, 6 tells us, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Um, so it's important for us to keep that in mind, too. This isn't just us, you know, 
knowing the Bible to the nth degree, like we have to believe it and we have to do the things in it for it to be effective. So it was a pretty deep dive on verse 1, but I thought it was important for us to set up the context there for us to understand the rest of the passage and make sure that we're challenging ourselves in those regards. Let's uh, pick up in verse 2 now um, to understand some of the basics of things that you know we need to understand. So um, we see here some pairs of things that go together as the basics. Um, repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Like we discussed earlier, this means we need to understand how to represent or how to repent and what it looks like to turn back toward God and have faith in Him. Um, we also see washings or baptisms and laying on of hands. And here, while we were talking about the different types of baptisms that were going on at the time and had in the hit, and had in the history of the Israelites, um, you know, kind of in Jesus coming about. I phrase that pretty poorly, but anyway, it's important for us to understand that they each that each of the separate baptisms had a time and place, but there's one true baptism today where we are immersed for the remission of our sins. And again, we don't have time to dig in on all of these, but I did want to call out that there are different baptisms mentioned in the Bible, but ultimately the one that is important to us today is the baptism for the remission of sins. And that's what we need to understand as our foundational layer to, um, you know, ultimately become Christians. But each of these baptisms had a purpose at a specific time. Um, and then, you know, we also see the laying on of hands mentioned here. Um, and that could be more specific to the passing on of miraculous gifts or broader towards the general approval of what others are doing or fellowship that they might be having. Um, I sent out an article along with this video that goes a little bit deeper into some of that for verses 1 and 2 that I think laid some helpful context for me as I was studying um, that I think would be helpful for you to read if you have any questions there. Um, then the last pairing that we see here is the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. So we know that the judgment day will come like a thief in the night and it is ultimately final. Uh, those who are alive and those who have already died will be judged, and we will need to give an account for what we've done. We go through all of that to say that we need to have a basic understanding of each of those concepts. That doesn't mean you need to be a scholar in the baptism, John, before you can move on to other things, just that you need to understand the one true baptism that saves us, along with some of those other points that we discussed. So now moving on to verse 3, um, it's essentially the Hebrews writer saying, you know, and we will all move on to be mature if God permits. And this is similar to when we say, um, if the Lord wills, I'll see you next week. It's important for us to have that complete reliance and dependence on God in order to grow um, and know that like everything comes from him. But it's not saying that God only allows some of us to mature and others of us to not. It is more of we want to be in accordance with God's will. And then as we move on to verse 4, the word for, F-O-R, connects the past three verses with what we're about to talk about. And I think this next part yeah, can be very misunderstood, and it's important to spend your time in your own study outside of this class to understand it as well. We're going to break it into some smaller chunks here um, to make sure that we understand it today, um, but would encourage you to study it more on your own. So, um, first of all, uh, we see those who have tasted the heavenly gift and become enlightened here. Um, and we become enlightened when we become Christians. So we see that in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. It reads, So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you will walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So we see here, when we become Christians, um, 
we are enlightened. We learn all these things, and the process of becoming a Christian is us learning these things and being enlightened, and that's what causes us to change, right? We change because of our belief in these things that we've heard. We put aside our old selves. This enlightenment causes us to realize and to continue to remember what we read or what we've all read before in John chapter 8, verse 12, where it says, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So if we you know, want to be in fellowship with Jesus and want to follow him, um, we have to do so, right? We have to remember what we've learned. We are enlightened, so we don't have an excuse. Um, you know, and next it talks about the heavenly gift and being partakers of the Holy Spirit, you know, when we're baptized and brought into fellowship with the Holy Spirit and other Christians, that ultimately allows us, if we do what we're supposed to, to be in heaven with God one day. We, you know, see Paul reference the fellowship of the Holy Spirit at the end of 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. We also see a reference to it. I thought we could take a look in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, where it says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And ultimately, um, you know, we see that the Spirit will dwell in us and we're building up to understanding why it is so sad when we choose to turn away from God after all of these good things have happened to us. Um, we also see in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, um, you know, more about what this looks like. So now on that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures said, from his innermost being will, flows, will flow rivers of living water. But this has, he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And I wanted to call this out to say that us being filled with the Spirit is tied to Christianity, because people, you know, they knew it was coming here, but it hadn't come yet because... Jesus hadn't died, so it couldn't be achieved yet. So we tie all these things together to set us up for um, continuing a little bit more to understand why it's so scary to fall away. So from there, the last couple things we see in verse 5 um, is about the tasting the good word of God through what he speaks to us in the Bible. And we know this. We read amazing things and know they are written for our learning and understanding. We've also seen the powers of God in action as a reminder of what he's capable of and what he will do for us in keeping his promises. This gives us a hope for heaven that helps motivate us to stay on the straight and narrow path, knowing that God will keep his promises. So, I say all that to say, when we go through the process of becoming a Christian, a lot happens that we are excited about and our life should change drastically. Once we've experienced those changes, there's a path we're on towards heaven, but we can become sidetracked from that path. In the early stages of our Christian life, we have unity and we're all bound, bonded in a common faith. You know, when you become a Christian, people, everybody kind of comes up and they give you hugs and everything, and it's a super exciting time. But as young Christians, it's also easy for us to be swayed to other doctrines or lose our diligence towards God. Um, you know, you can come out really come out of the waters of baptism, really on fire for God, and then that can slowly start to burn out if we don't do what we've talked about and gain that spiritual maturity. That's where verse 6 can be scary if we don't understand it. And it's still scary even if we do. At face value, some people read this verse as, once you become a Christian, if you fall away, you can't come back to God. Now, I've heard different interpretations of that. Just that is a point blank statement that if you commit a bad enough sin, you can't come back to God. Um, you know, and this simply isn't true. As we know throughout the Bible, there's multiple examples of repentance and people doing really bad things and God calling for them to repent and taking them back. Instead, what we see here is that even though God does all these amazing things and has provided us with so much, we can still turn away from him. If we've seen all these things, 
We should have the drives down the path to heaven, even though we will mess up and sin. However, there is a real danger that we are warned about here in that we can completely turn our backs on God. And I think what we're trying to get at in this passage is it's one thing for people who never really knew God to not follow him. Um, you know, they didn't understand all these things we just talked about. So, you know, why would they follow God? But when we understand all these things and we've chosen to follow God, it's extremely difficult for someone who knows all that and chooses to turn their back on God to come back to God, right? Because what's going to happen to them that prompts them to do that if they've made that decision to, you know, turn around and crucify him again? So I think that's really what we're getting at here, right? It's not that you can commit some sin that makes you not able to turn back and be restored. It is more of the, if you follow the proper steps of repentance, it's more of the fact, if we know all these things and we choose to turn away, clearly we can't be saved if we never repent of what we do and we never want that close relationship with God again. So to sum it up, it's impossible to restore ourselves to spiritual fellowship um, if we reject repentance. So we should avoid falling into that mentality at all costs. I think we see this illustrated with an example here about the ground. Um, so we'll read verses 7 and 8 real quick. For ground, the ground that drinks rain often... Um, I didn't have my verse in there. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those who, for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. So we see this illustration about the types of ground and what's yielded from it. Um, you know, we can choose to be the ground that drinks the rain often, or, you know, that's us as we continue to take in blessings from God and his word. And we'll produce vegetation, and God blesses that because we're being productive like we discussed earlier and doing what we need to do there. That's where we want to be, um, taking in the rain and using it to do the things that God wants. However, if we ignore these blessings that we're given and instead grow thorns and thistles, we are not furthering God's cause, and he will not bless us, and we will end up being punished for it. Essentially, we want to fight as hard as we can to not become so callous that we don't see the need to return to God and ask for forgiveness. Now let's move on to verses 9 through 12. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name, and having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now the Hebrews writer needs to explain why he wrote the last eight verses. It wasn't because God and the writer didn't think the readers would be able to accomplish growing in spiritual maturity, right? It was because, just like us today, we need to recognize what we're capable of and the fact that we can strive for it and the challenges that we're going to face. You know, we are going to face tough times, but ultimately with God, we can get through those tough times. And so we need to be aware of those challenges in the Bible. You know, that's one of the things that I really appreciate that God does for us is he doesn't say this is all going to be easy. He lays out the challenges for us. And then the other thing that's really nice is that God recognizes the hard work that we have done. Uh, you know, we see that here in verse 10. And this can be a refreshing experience as sometimes on the job or in our homes or in various places of life, we may not be appreciated for the good things we do, and that can be pretty demotivating. But with God, we can rest assured that if we keep our end of the deal, God will do what he promised and let us dwell with him eternally in heaven. From this passage, we see he expects us to keep growing in him and his word. We are to use that to love him and take care of those around us, that expectation and that spending time in his word and growing. It's important for us to properly balance our actions, like showing kindness and love towards others and increasing in the knowledge we have in the Bible. Just having knowledge and acting on it, um, just having knowledge and not acting on it does us no good. But if we're only doing good deeds and not knowing why or sharing the gospel along with those things, that also is not good and not advancing us 
towards that spiritual maturity and closeness with God. Um, I think 2 Timothy 4 verses 1 through 2 summarizes this up pretty well. It says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. So we are to be ready in that we know the word of Christ and we put it into action to help others. We need to be ready to reprove, rebuke, exhort. But in order to do that, we need to know what we're talking about. So that's how this all ties together. Like we've talked about the past two weeks, we must have diligence to the same level or higher than those before us. God promises us eternal rest, and we should use that hope to drive us to continue on studying his word and serving him. We must recognize when we start to become sluggish and overcome that to be pleasing to God. And we can recognize if we're being sluggish by looking at how we're doing compared to our goals and what we've thought about and how we want to move, improve as Christians. Now, the book didn't cover verses 13 through 20. Uh, I wanted to hit on them really quickly before we end tonight. So we'll read those together. Uh, this is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of the Melchizedek. So, like I said, we're just going to hit lightly on this for the sake of time, but there's a few key points I wanted to call out about this passage. Um, I wanted to call out here, Abraham trusted God and did what he asked ultimately in a couple different ways, but one of the big ones was being willing to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham knew God would reward his faith because God promised that he would. God swore by himself because he is all powerful and the greatest thing that could be sworn on. We often swear on something greater than ourselves. You may have heard someone say, I swear on my grandmother's grave or something like that. It's important for us to understand that we can trust God's promise because he swore it based on himself, which is the highest thing we can base our trust on if we understand all those things we already covered today. And so the main reason I wanted to hit on this chunk is because knowing this and having the hope for that promise is what can help us not to fall away. Thinking about that home that we'll have in heaven with him one day, the promises that he's made to us can help us stay on that straight and narrow. And so, you know, that is the reason that it's called out here for us to understand and look at Abraham's example is to tie together the things we've studied over the past couple weeks. For us to be successful, we have to understand the milk, but then we have to move on to spiritual growth. If you're not growing, you're sliding back. There's no, you know, just staying at the status quo. You have to be advancing and learning more about God to grow as a Christian. So, with that all, let's keep that hope in mind when we struggle throughout this week or the rest of this year um, and use it to motivate us to serve God in the way that we need to. So it's been a pleasure teaching you all virtually these past three weeks. Um, so I'll, I'll probably be turning it over to Baxter next week, but let's close out with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and everything that you've blessed us with. Help us to serve you to the best of our ability and to constantly look for ways to grow in you. Help us to um, become complete as Christians and to just strive to be closer to you every day. We thank you for everything that you give us and just help all those who are struggling with the pandemic right now and help everyone in decision-making positions to make the right decisions that are in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name, amen.